to the second theme for tonight. So we've talked so far about the adults and some of the anxieties that parents uh, might be feeling and how potentially to deal with some of those. Uh, we've also had some questions about managing the children that have continued to come through. And uh, the first one is to do with this idea of, okay, we can't control everything. And I think that's already been referred to this evening. So thinking about what we can control and what we can't control. And one of the examples that's been given to me was about the news, because it's pretty grim. Now, you'll have to excuse me, my dog has decided to scratch the couch behind me. I don't know if you can hear that. I might try and get my husband to come and take the dog. He has this little habit. Sorry about that. Um, so sh should, we, should we think about things like not watching the news? I mean, should we do stuff like that when it's all a bit grim and dark? I might direct that to Bianca. Sorry, I forgot to add that. That's all right. Um, I I tend to agree that minimising the amount of information and distress that you're putting on yourself um, can be really helpful. Um, media hypes things up to ridiculous levels, um, some real, some not real, um, and it can be very difficult to decipher um, and to make sense of that for yourself. Um, when often it is, it comes from, um, I don't know, I, I mean, it sells newspapers and it sells the, the news. So um, we need to be, I think we need to be very mindful about for ourselves how much we, we consume, but also our, our children. Um, the news is not appropriate for most children to be listening to because there are so many things discussed on there that are not appropriate, particularly for primary school children, to understand, to, to make sense of it for themselves. Whereas um, older older kids can um, consume some of it, but it's it's helping them learn what's the limit, what is enough information for them to know. Is it okay for them to know the, the case numbers for the day, and that's about it? Mm -hmm. um, do they need to know the hype about is this vaccine good, is this vaccine not good, all that, all those sort of things? Um, and it's helping them be able to make an educated decision based on the information that they get. Um, and and it, it can be very tricky to decipher what is real and what you should listen to. Sort of link. Add, oh, sorry, Michelle, sorry. go on. Um, can I just add, I agree um, completely with Bianca. Um, and one thing that I've discovered um, since having children myself is a program called BTN News Break. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a short five minute news bulletin and it's designed for children. Um, and so in my family, we watch that each day, just that five minute news break each day. And it really helps. Um, I think it's a great program and it helps children to know and to understand what's happening. Um, but it's um, presented in a way that's really easy to understand and it's very child friendly. Um, so if you do choose to share the news um, with your children, that's what I would recommend a program like that. And for memory, BTN is stands for Behind the News. My parents, are, my kids are a fair bit older. Is that that's yep. through the ABC? I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Terrific. Yep. So I guess if people just do a Google search, they'll pick that up. Now, link to that, and I don't know which one of you may want to answer. I might stick with Michelle for the moment. So a child. They might be watching the news. They, what are the signs that a little a, a little child or a teenager even is potentially becoming overwhelmed by things like watching the news? Are there any things that we as adults can look for in these young people in the home situation? I think what's critical or what's most important is to um, recognise or to know that you, the parents, you know your children best. And to then look for signs that they're not, um, that your child might not be behaving in a way that's typical for them. Um, so um, it might be that they're normally um, an upbeat child, um, someone who has a positive temperament, and you might notice that they seem, um, their mood seems to be lower than what it would normally be. And so I guess to answer your question, what's critical? 
is to really think about and reflect on whether there's been a change in their behaviour um, and how they're presenting themselves. And going back to what we were talking about earlier um, around whether um, examining whether or not um, the way that we're behaving um, or how we're experiencing things is interfering with our capacity to be able to do what we would normally be doing. And so if we see that in our children, um, that's a sign that we might need to um, seek help for our children. Terrific, thank you. Um, Mark, I'm, I'm sorry, apologies, I, I can just see your name. Could I get you to mute your mic, please, if that's all right? We can just hear some noises coming through and we're recording tonight. So, um, you know, for your privacy particularly as well, you may, thank you very much, you're wonderful. Um, now, the uh, the next one is is not an uncommon one, and I've had a few parents say this to me. It's to do with, I'm concerned my child is, quote, not working. Um, they are tending to perhaps find the old computer games and uh, it, it is often a, a concern that's related to boys and the, uh, the, they get on the old computer games. How should I handle this? How, how forceful should I be? And, and I might get Bianca to respond initially to this, but just before I hand over to Bianca, can I just say from the school's perspective, after the long lockdown last year, we did a whole lot of data analysis and testing on the progress of the children. And in actual fact, and we sort of suspected this, for children at a school like ours, the, uh, they had not really fallen behind. The children that we expected to struggle, yes, they struggled and, they, and we knew that certain interventions were required. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to say that next week, if people are interested, I'm actually um, thinking of doing a session on learning and the impact of online um, sort of situations for learning. We'll have the NAPLAN results hopefully available to schools by then. They're start, starting to slip out in the papers at the moment. But some of our community, I hope, will know already that for our cohort at St Margaret's Barrett Grammar, we were um, very uh, pleased with the progress of m absolutely the majority of the children. Uh, you'll know that certainly our Year 12s blitzed last year and uh, we know that uh, we've got a whole lot of re potential reasons for that. Who really, really knows? But um, I, I did want to reassure parents that there is very a lot of diagnostic testing when children do come back after periods of lockdown. And I'd like to think as a school, we've got our finger on the pulse of how they're going. But having said that, do you have a general question uh, responses to, you know, how hard do I come down as mum or dad on our, our little whoever, Johnny or Betty, or whoever who seems to be playing a lot of online computer games? Um. I had that this week with my own um, <laughs> caught him playing games instead of doing his writing. Um, so it, it, it's about having a conversation with them. He was, he was avoiding doing something that was hard that he finds really challenging and he, it was much easier to play the game that had been linked on his school site. Um, and, and it's much more fun. So it's having a conversation of how do we do the things we need to do? How do we get through, push our way through the hard stuff we don't have to be really good at it. We just have to give it a go. Um, and then as a reward, then you can play your game um, and put not some nice limits on it. Things that are fair, yes, you can extend it to what you wouldn't usually do. Uh, but have it have it in moderation of, um, okay, you've played some game. Now you need to go outside, get some fresh air, run around for a bit. And then you can come in and do something different. And then if you want to play your game again, we can work out a time that that's going to work. So I, I think it's, it's the juggle, finding the balance. Mm. Yes, our kids have to be entertained more because we're busy working, we're doing all the things that we need to do and we can't supervise them permanently the whole time. Um, and, it's, and it's finding that balance, that's the challenge. Yeah, so <laughs> conversations. Sorry, Michelle, you, you please say. I was going to say I've had a similar conversation with my son <laughs> this week as well around um, using or playing different games. Um, when he was uh, supposed to be doing some other work. And I guess um, I really like what Bianca says around having those conversations and 
And I would just add that the way that I think about it in my mind is um, adopting what I call a friendly but firm approach or what I also call the connect and redirect approach, um, you know, maybe by saying, I can see how much you're enjoying playing those games, but now is the time for doing X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and like Bianca was saying, I think it's also, it's really important that we stick to um, some regular and predictable routines and activities and, uh, where possible. And so we can then remind our kids that at such and such time, we'll be going um, outside for a play or having fun outside. Can I pick up, please, on something Bianca said? Um, you said, Bianca, that in, in that example, that the child perhaps was not quite sure what to do, so they just moved in another direction. Um, yep. and, and look, I, I suspect that's probably quite common, and, and I remember my children doing that as well. So if, if you, anyone who's listening, think that your children, that might be the situation with your children, please don't hesitate to reach out to the school or the teachers because that's a classic behaviour, whether they're online or not online, um, and they're at school of uh, just kind of going, well, look, this is all too hard. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to find something else to do. So one thing I'd like to think teachers are very good at usually is either breaking down the task or rephrasing the task or reimagining the task so that the child does feel that they can do it. So, you know, if you think your child is in that situation, and as I said, these questions have come from parents, so you won't be the only one, and every child is different. So uh, you know your children best, as a bit has been said, um, but the school can certainly, I believe, hope and help with, uh, with some strategies there. Ah, now hope, no, funny. Just, yes, go on. Sorry, just one more, one more little thing um, around games. Another thing that can make um, games a bit more, not, um, a bit more inclusive of everybody is suggesting that you, you sit with them and play the game with them or watch them play the game um, so that they feel like they're connecting with you. So my son was thrilled with the idea of me sitting there watching his game and playing with him. Um, so it's, it's, it's doing some of those sort of things as well. It's, it's connecting with them and then it's understanding their schoolwork as well. So, oh, what did you do with this? And it, oh, I really like how you put that together and it look, looks like you put a lot of effort into that. Um, and, and paying lots of close interest to what they're doing school-wise, but also in their games, and it creates a nice connection with you kids. Mm, absolutely. Now, um, I, I accidentally used the word hope, but that, in fact, is the key word in the next question because uh, I, I, I understand there's a lot of people that think if young people and older people don't have a sense of hope, it can actually be a pretty dark place. Given that we don't know when lockdown might end, uh, and Michelle, I might start with you. What, how can we instill perhaps a sense of hope, either in ourselves, but in our children as well? I, I um, am a firm believer that we can instill hope in ourselves and in our children by uh, sharing stories about, about people helping people um, about people persevering during challenging times. And we can do this in lots of different ways. So we could um, share stories about our own family members um, or about members of our community who are part of history um, and who themselves have persevered during challenging times. Um, so for example, I just recently finished reading a history of our school um, and you might be familiar with this book um, <laughs> um, this history um, and I shared with my children the story of how members of our school community coped during the polio epidemic in the 1930s um, and I talked with them about all of the closures the school closures and cancellations and things being postponed um, and I think that sharing these types of stories um, and stories of people persevering um, during challenging times that can really help our children and also ourselves to understand that we can persevere and that we can cope. Um, and it also helps us to feel connected um, to the people that we're um, talking about in the stories that we share. 
Uh, yeah, that's nice. Bianca, have you got any things that you use to engender hope ge just generally and perhaps particularly in this in this situation as well too? Um, I, think, I think hope is about uh, looking forward, looking toward, making plans for things in the future. So um, maybe not concrete plans because that all <laughs> gets changed, but holding out hope for, for that missed holiday and the opportunity to do that again and, and the opportunity to see our friends and our family in person. Um, and and looking forward to those times when we're able to celebrate all of the missed milestones um, and 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 planning planning for things is really important in hope. Mm. I, look, I, I would agree with that. And you know, bottom line, I, I I'd like to think this will end, whether it's through vaccination rates or whatever the case may be. But look, we will. Um, the hum, human race has got through all sorts of challenges in the past. You mentioned polio. We know about the uh, great flu epidemic in uh, the early 20th century. And uh, it's not the first time we have been challenged. I mean, it is still an extraordinary event to live through. And I do wonder how we'll reflect on it all in, say, 10 years time. Um, now, we, that that sort of brings us to the end of the questions that were forwarded it to us. I'll just remind listeners that if you do want to put any question in the chat space, I'll please feel welcome um, while, uh, while you're having a think. And, and it can be a specific question by all means, and we'll do what we can to, uh, to answer it. Um, and while perhaps listeners are having a bit of a think about that, I guess one of the things, and I mentioned this last time, I hope folk don't mind me mentioning it again, but I'm a firm believer in one of the strongest skills we can teach our young people is it's called being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, the rate of change in the world, the impacts of technology, globalization, pandemics, whatever you might call it, uh, that sense of control, if we ever thought we had it, uh, and I'd question that anyway, but um, it is the case that I think that we are losing it as a human race, or it, it won't be a reality, or if you think it's, you're probably not correct. So in a funny sort of way, what our young people are going through now is one of the most valuable lessons, I believe, that they can ever learn, and what we are going through as adults as well too. And I know that this, what is it, sixth lockdown has had its own challenges, but I also recognise, and I know this from our community, that when it was announced that we were going back into lockdown, whatever it was, four and then five, the, the absolute, well, we, we never panicked, but the, the really heightened anxiety just isn't there anymore. And we are getting used to uh, what it means living in lockdown. Having said that, the sort of on, off, on, off, that is a new space for a lot of us. And I think that's what's uh, perhaps challenging us more than ever. But, uh, uh, it, we are lucky, and I think psych, schools having psychologists, and I was saying this to Michelle and Bianca earlier this week, that uh, I'm old enough to remember when I started teaching, schools didn't even have psychologists. So uh, I think that our young people are very lucky, and schools are very lucky that we do have access to professionals like Michelle and Bianca. Now, I'm just having a look in the chat. Look, I, I don't know... You're all being very shy, and that's absolutely fine. Um, what I might suggest is that people are always welcome to send questions through, and we will post responses on uh, Nexus and various other channels, whatever you find the most useful. And just to flag, and again, happy to do this if people think you might be interested, and please let us know, that uh, I would like to potentially explore the truth about lock learning in lockdown. There's a lot of stories in the newspapers about how terrible this is or awful that is. My sense, as I said, in a school like ours is actually quite different. And I'd be very, very happy to explore some of the data that's coming out. And we, a lot of people are doing research in this area as to how the young people are faring in terms of their learning during lockdown. Now, it's certainly not all rosy, the data, but it is, it is very interesting and it's certainly not all gloomy either.